Today is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Please take the hymnal from the pew rack in front of you. Turn to hymn number 335. Let's stand and sing together. Good morning. Good morning. How awesome it is for us to be able to worship and fellowship with each other once again. I'd like to welcome any visitors or guests that we may have in our worship service, as well as any guests that may be joining us via online or television. We welcome each and every one of you a part of our worship service on today. If you would, there's a card in the front of your uh, pew. I'd encourage you to fill it out if you have any prayer requests or any questions about Second Ponce de Leon Baptist Church. Feel free to complete that, and this allows our staff to better pray for you and understand the area in which we can support you and answer any questions that you may have. As always, we have so many exciting things happening at our church. Our choir will be having practice on Saturday, so if you are interested in joining the choir, please come out. Breakfast starts at 9 o'clock, and practice will begin from 10 to 12. Additionally, we are in need of volunteers. Our uh, fall festival is coming up, and so there are volunteers uh, needed for that, so you can contact the engaged team if you're interested, as well as our trunk or treat happening on October 25th. If you're interested in volunteering for that, please see Reverend Kelly Denton or myself for that, and please refer to the back of your order of worship for other announcements and events. As we move forward in worship, let us pray this morning. Gracious, 
loving and just God. We give thanks. In the midst of the rain and the tropical storms and even our daily lives, we give thanks because you are God. We thank you for being comfort in the presence of worry, being peace in the presence of chaos. Lord, we give thanks. So during our time of worship this morning, allow us to experience you in a new and refreshed way. Be with us this morning. Guide us, walk with us, and help us. It is in your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our responsive reading is printed in your order of worship. Brothers and sisters, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? No, in all things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons, neither the present nor the future, nor any powers, neither height nor depth, nor anything else in creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Hallelujah. Let's stand and sing. Hear these words this morning from the prophet Isaiah, praising God for his deliverance and salvation. From chapter 25, beginning at verse 1 through verse 9. O Lord, you are my God. I will exalt you. I will praise your name, for you have done wonderful things. Plans formed of old, faithful and sure. For you have made the city a heap, the fortified city a ruin, the palace of aliens is a city no more. It will never be rebuilt. Therefore, strong peoples will glorify you. Cities of ruthless nations will fear you. For you have been a refuge to the poor, a refuge to the needy in their distress. 
a shelter from the rainstorm and a shade from the heat. When the blast of the ruthless was like a winter rainstorm, the noise of the aliens like a heat in a dry place. You subdued the heat with the shade of the clouds, the song of the ruthless was stilled. On this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wines, of rich food filled with marrow, of well-aged wine strained clear. And he will destroy on this mountain the shroud that is cast over all peoples, the sheath that is spread over all nations. He will swallow up death forever. Then the Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces and the disgrace of his people he will take away from all the earth for the Lord has spoken it will be said on that day lo this is our God we have waited for him so that he might save us this is the Lord for whom we have waited let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation Oh. 
Thank you, Robert. Hymn 361, let us express our own love for our Savior. Let's stand and sing together. morning. Devoted to serve. To me, service equates to missions, and a portion of all tithes and offerings go towards missions. Most everything we do as a church in some way is serving and missions. Of course, as most of y'all know, I hold TML close to my heart. I could talk about it all day, but I won't do that for you. Um, we've had great experiences the last two summers, and we've actually committed to three more summers, so you still have a chance uh, to join us for, for, uh, if you ever feel like the need that you'd like to do that. Some examples of service and missions to me is working at the Peachtree Road Race Water Station, working with a child that's got dyslexia, teaching them how to read and that, reading the same thing over and over again, then finally the light comes on and they understand what they read. That's missions. Giving food to the Buck, Buckhead Christian Ministry, that's also missions. Playing basketball with the kid, letting him beat you and beat you and beat you, and then finally skunking him and teaching him a very valuable lesson in how to lose and how to lose with be a good sport about it and that you're not going to always win. Serving hot dogs to the neighborhood kids at Trunk or Treat. Being hugged by kids as, that you've worked with for a week and they love you and hope that you come back next year, that's missions. 
volunteering at Garden Hills Fall Festival on the 21st. That's also missions. Missions is a big part of Second Ponce and is why I pledge and tithe. As you pray about your pledge this month, ask yourself, what does missions mean to me? Please pray with me. Dear Lord, you continually work to transform the brokenness of this world. You lift us up when we stumble so that we may honor you and live for your purpose. Help us to tell others about your son, Jesus. Fill our hearts with your spirit of generosity so that our lives and our offerings will be pleasing unto you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain standing for hymn 356. Therefore, I tell you, do not worry about your lives, what you will eat, or your body, what you will wear. For life is more than food, and the body more than clothing. Consider the ravens, they neither sow nor reap, they have neither storehouse nor barn, and yet God feeds them. Of how much more value are you than the birds? And can any of you, by worrying, add even a single hour to your span of life. And if then you're not able to do so small a thing as this, then why do you worry about the rest? Let us pray. Gather us, O oh God. Calm our hearts. Quiet our minds so that we might hear you. The world is broken. In so many ways, we are broken. And every day brings new horrors, desperation and frustration in, in Puerto Rico and anger and brokenness in Las Vegas. Natural disasters, shootings, death, 
countless reminders of our fragility. We are tired. We are worried. But you are not a distant, disconnected father. We know that you are concerned with every aspect of our lives. You do not turn your face from us in our time of need. We know that you are close to the brokenhearted, a refuge for the oppressed. So speak to us now. Remind us that you are with us, that your grace is all that we need, that even when the world feels like it's spiraling out of control, when the future seems dark, that you are with us. Living God, comfort those who are mourning, our brothers and sisters who are hurting. Provide peace to those who are fearful. Bring healing and wholeness to the afflicted. We lay our worries at your feet, asking that in our infirmity, your power might become more evident. We bring our fears to you with confidence, knowing that you're able to transform any situation. Restore our souls, renew our minds, and strengthen our hearts for the work that you have called us to do. And there is much to do. We ask these things in the name of your Son. Amen. Each week, Steve Rotz rotates two other staff members into worship leadership with us. And this morning, I was just grateful that the two leading us uh, were the two McAfee students who were a part of, our, of this season of ministry with us. I'm just grateful for a church that believes in this investment, that we strengthen the larger church by inviting seminary students here to grow into their pastoral identity, but also just grateful for what they bring to us. What a great gift it is to have Tim and Chelsea here with us and leading in so many good ways. Our scripture this morning, the text for the sermon, Philippians 4, the first nine verses. Paul writes to the church at Philippi, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, my beloved. I urge Eudodia and I urge Sintichia to be of the same mind in the Lord. Yes, and I ask you also, my loyal companion, help these women, for they've struggled beside me in the work of the gospel, together with Clement and the rest of my co-workers, whose names are in the book of life. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say, rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to everyone. The Lord is near. Do not worry about anything, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, beloved, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence and if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, and the God of peace will be with you.
Last Sunday, when we were all gathered in this room, we gathered around the communion table set up right here, beautifully set up. I love communion Sundays. It's, it's always a highlight for me. And the table, beautiful as usual. The chalice and paten we use on that table uh, each time we come together is from the old Second Baptist Church, part of our merger, part of our founding, part of our history. It dates back to the 1700s. But every time we gather, it sparkles like new money. It's because of Jeannie Patterson's stewardship. Jeannie and her communion team never fail. We're talking about stewardship again, by the way. You know, all month, y'all remember that? And as one measure of her stewardship, Jeannie takes the communion set, cares for it, polishes it, puts it in lint-free cloth. It's, it's part of her corner of our collective work together. And every time we celebrate communion, she and her team get here early. They, they set up the table. It's perfectly arranged. The bread is bought. The cups are filled every single time. And including the interim, I have been here for five years, and every time the table is perfect. So why do you think I come early on the days we're celebrating the Lord's Supper and sneak in here before any of you are here to make sure it's set up? Because I worry. It's just my nature to worry. I've just got to have something to worry about. And it's been right every single time, but still I just need to check. What if? What if Jeannie forgets? What if? She's never forgotten. Across the Sundays of October, we're looking at the enemies of our gratitude, the culprits that steal our sense of delight, take away our generosity and our gratefulness, that keep us from being joy-filled. Last week, we talked about the enemy of nostalgia. Today, the joy thief goes by the name of worry. But what if? How much joy do you figure has been stolen out of your life by worry? Most Friday afternoons before I leave the office, I print my sermon out. Now, I come here every Sunday at 6.30. I go over the sermon over and over and over. I make final edits, and about 8.30 I print it a final time. So I don't really need to print it on Friday afternoon. But what if? What if we were out of toner? What if? I just print an early one just in case. Now, there's a difference between being prepared and worrying. I mean, to be sure, I check on the communion like, like a pilot does a pre-flight checklist. It's not the behavior that's problematic. It's just all the worry that keeps me from being free. I worry about rational things and irrational things. The sermon today, by the way, is the only for those of you who do this too. The rest of you can go back to sleep. <laughs> Melissa will wake, me some, will wake up sometimes in the middle of the night sensing that I'm not asleep, and she'll say a little too sharply, what are you doing awake? <laughs> and I'll say, just fretting, go back to sleep. And these are the little things, whether or not there's toner. I mean, that's the little stuff. I have a three-year-old grandson, and he's growing up in a world where a man unloads a few of his many, many guns into a Jason Aldean concert. About a month after a man drives his car into a group of people because he's so filled with hate and rage. There's a lot to worry about. And if you worry like I do, you know worry is a thief. It's impossible to operate out of freedom and generosity while also being bound by worry. Have you run into Don Joseph Galway's research on worry in his book, The End of Stress? 
He reports that 85% of what we worry about never happens. 85%. The communion table is always perfect. My sermon always prints. 85%. And still I lie awake at night thinking about the worst case scenario, even though only 15% of it's going to materialize. It turns out that Michel de Montagne was right when he wrote, my life has been filled with terrible misfortune, most of which never happened. (laughs) Worry is a thief. In the 1800s, R.C. Trench was the Protestant Archbishop of Dublin, and and he suffered a morbid fear of being paralyzed. Every day he got up and wondered, is this today? Oh, my legs work. He had this fear every day that he was going to be paralyzed, a constant worry. One night he was at a dinner party, and the woman sitting next to him heard him mumble to himself, Oh, it's happened at last, a total insensibility of the right limb. He thought his fears were finally realized. He thought he was surely paralyzed at last when she said, Your Grace, it may comfort you to learn that it is my leg you are pinching. (laughs) But we just worry. Now, I'm not suggesting that you turn a blind eye to the serious concerns of health and finance and relationship and evil in the world and all the rest. I'm just suggesting that we challenge the productivity of our worry and listen together, listen afresh to Paul's counsel on the matter. The Apostle Paul writes, Rejoice! Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And it's an odd advice written from a prison cell. Now, prison's a horrible place today. But in the first century, it was no picnic at all. Confinement and rations and no air conditioning and no plumbing. Just consider for a minute confinement with no plumbing. And from the chains of prison, he scratches out these words. Rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I'll say it. Rejoice. Well, the church he was writing to, the church at Philippi, was not rejoicing. They were not rejoicing. They were worrying too. They were just, oh my goodness. First of all, two women in the church were fussing with each other. And it was causing a big stir in the community. What's this going to do to the church? We love all this fussing. Not to mention, it's been such a long time since their leader has been to see them. Paul's been in chains for so many years. There's, what's the promise of his return visit? We don't know. What are we going to do? We don't have a leader. The women are fussing with each other. What are we going to do? And so they just worry. All the joy was gone. The joy in the church just gone. Our church leaders in prison, the women are fussing. We haven't had any new church members in weeks. We're behind in the budget. Sunday school numbers are down. I'm just worried to death. And Paul says, do not worry about anything. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. There are two parts to Paul's advice. and Most people only offer one part of that advice. Most people will tell you, oh, stop your worrying. There's nothing to worry about. Stop your worrying. But that's insufficient advice. Paul says, do not worry, stop your worrying. But then he adds this important second step. In everything, with prayer and supplication, 
With thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. There's got to be a discipline involved in moving your worry to joy. Your worry has to get converted. It has to be converted. So just preach to your worry like an old revival tent preacher. Just preach to it. Tell it to repent. Return to joy. Joy is a discipline of perception. It's not an emotion that comes and goes based on circumstances. Joy is not an escape from pain. But it's a consideration, a recalibration. It's seeing from a different perspective. And we only get that broader perspective through prayer. In the discipline of prayer, we can see our troubles in their right sides. Last week, I was in Yellowstone National Park. I flew out early Monday morning, flew back late yesterday afternoon. I was invited to participate in a conversation called the Jesus Worldview Initiative. Johnny Pierce, who's the editor of Nurturing Faith magazine, invited 10 of us from around the country to come into this discussion. It was wonderful. But the whole time I was away, I worried. But there were two significant brush fires going on in the church while I was away, and I didn't have cell phone service most of the time, so I just worried myself sick. And then how's this for irony? I had not written a sermon, so I was worried about writing the sermon on worry. That's really good. Well, no free time in the schedule. When am I going to write the bus? Well, our group, our, our group at Yellowstone, was mostly pastors from around the country. We had a really productive conversation, but we were at Yellowstone, so we also had some really great sightseeing. And at one point, we pulled up our, our uh, van to Lake Yellowstone, which is just magnificent. A massive lake. It's more than two times the size of Lake Lanier. The lake was framed with snow-capped mountains, bright yellow aspen trees. It was breathtaking. We got out. We snapped our pictures. We oohed and odd. And then after a while, some of that settled down. And the whole group was just silent in front of this majestic picture. Big sky country is right vast sky, stillness, mountains, and I began to pray, and my soul started to relax. And after several minutes of us just standing there in awe together, I turned to the pastor of First Baptist Church, Richmond, and I said, I needed this. There's perspective here. As it turns out, my church is getting along just fine without me. I'm not as important as I thought I was. Something about being here reminds me of that. God is at second points even when I'm not. And plus, out here, the things I've been worrying about just seem smaller, and God seems bigger. And I think if I could do this once a quarter... I could come off my blood pressure medicine. <laughs> Through prayer, our perspective changes. God becomes bigger, our worries become smaller, and there's room for joy to grow. The Apostle Paul rejoiced from prison because joy is an inner discipline, it's not an external condition. How much joy do you figure you've lost over the years because you just worried it out of you? And 85% of what we worry about doesn't happen anyway. And of the 15% that does happen, how does our constant fretting make that much difference in the outcome? Abraham Lincoln, when he was a circuit-riding lawyer, 
he and a bunch of riding companions had, were going uh, to a court session away. They had crossed several rivers together, but they had not yet crossed the Fox River. The Fox River was the big river that they still had to get over before they got to their session. And while they would cross a river, they would just worry. Yeah, we crossed that one fine, but we hadn't gotten to the Fox River. The Fox River is the one that's going to give us the trouble. Well, as they got closer, they stopped at a local, uh, at a local ta log tavern. They fell in with a Methodist presiding elder who was also a local. He had crossed the Fox River any number of times. They found out that he was somebody to talk to about crossing the Fox River. So they got him over in a corner and they just peppered him with their questions. We've got to know about the Fox River. Tell us how to cross. The Methodist elder said, I know all about the Fox River. I've crossed it often and I understand it well. But I have one fixed rule with regard to the Fox River. I never cross it till I reach it. <laughs> Worry is the thief that steals our capacity for joy and generosity. I learned this week that lakes and snow-capped mountains are great, but they're not necessary. The difference maker is the prayer. And Friday morning from the front porch of my ranch cabin, I watched the sunrise and I prayed through Paul's advice. I prayed this scripture, his teaching about how to defeat the enemy of worry, and then it dawned on me, dawn was a pun by the way, did y'all catch that? It was early in the morning, it dawned on me, the sun rises everywhere I am. I don't need Yellowstone Park to lay my burdens into God's care. I can pray this prayer at sunrise any day, any time. The Apostle Paul rejoiced from prison for crying out loud. Because joy is an inner discipline, not an external condition. And here is the worry-defeating advice that Paul taught us. Will you hear his words this morning as your prayer? Finally, beloved, Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is pleasing, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence and if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Keep on doing the things that you've learned and received and heard and seen in me. And the God of peace will be with you. Wow. The gospel is full of good news. Think about all the things you could do in freedom and generosity if you just didn't worry so much. And the God of peace will be with you. Let's stand and sing and celebrate the God who holds us in wholeness.
Would you be seated for a moment because we have things to celebrate before we go. And here's one of them. This is Lindsay Intrican. And Lindsay has come to profess her faith in Christ and her decision to be baptized. Because of this great family and the discussions they've been having and this children's ministry, did you see Kelly and Miss Kelly and Miss Chelsea come back in. Did you see them come back in? Yeah, they wanted to be a part of this too. Because this church has been nurturing and praying and this family has been nurturing and praying, Lindsay came to my office this morning and she said, I'm ready to declare that Jesus is Lord, He's my Savior, and I want to follow Him in baptism. If you celebrate this with her and this family, I need a really strong amen. All right, that, we'll take it. Yay. We have another celebration today. Before you stand, I'm going to ask Miss Allery Leach to stand, please. Allery, one week ago today, turned 104. <laughs> Is that great? Now, we don't usually do birthdays, but look, if you're 104, we're doing your birthday in here. What a great celebration. And to have you walk into worship is just a delight to see. Would the rest of you stand with her for the benediction? And before you get out of here, come celebrate with Lindsay this great, great day. Go now and do not worry. For the peace of God that passes all understanding goes with you. Go in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. We are delighted that through the gift of technology you were able to worship with us today. So many of you are faithful viewers on the AIB network watching us Monday evenings or 11 o'clock Sunday morning. Others of you are streaming us at home on your laptops, your personal devices. My dad in South Carolina watches us each week on his 55-inch smart TV. However this message is reaching you, we're honored that you've been a part of this experience. But we need to talk honestly about the limitation of the TV experience. Our gathered community on Sunday morning is having worship as a community. We don't play to the camera. TV is not our primary audience. We are the gathered community, and the television viewer is watching and participating as able. But if you are able, we would love to have you in the room because there is an added benefit to being a part of the gathered community of faith. Have you ever noticed how many of the miracles of Jesus involve touch? Jesus touched people when he healed them. And we believe that's an important part of the incarnational ministry. Our worship will be stronger, and I think your experience will be richer. If you're physically able, please join us on Sunday morning and worship with us. Mm -hmm.